welcome back to Haunted and Historic Australia. We have another episode today of Criminals, Cutthroats and Convicts. In this episode, we are looking at two very strong women, Margaret Catchpole and Mary Ryby. Both very strong women, both horse stealers, and both were transported to Australia. But this is where the similarities in their stories differ, although many people have mixed the two ladies up, including a story written about Margaret Catchpole with Mary Reby's ending. You can definitely see how these women could have been mixed up, but they do lead very different lives. We'll start with Margaret Catchpole. Like most of our stories, a lot of the information has come down through hundreds of years therefore it could be a little bit confused on the way down to us there are many different sources that claim margaret was born in nacton which is a coastal village southeast of ipswich in the suffolk district other sources say that she was most likely born in the brandiston area of suffolk which is northeast of Ipswich in the Suffolk region. Brandiston actually has a bit of a dark past. It is believed that a vicar by the name of John Lowe was accused of witchcraft in 1645. There seem to be two stories told for Margaret before she is transported to Australia. The first is a dark tale of life in workhouses a workhouse was meant to be a place of refuge for those less fortunate, where you could work to pay your way. And many have started out that way in the early 1500s, but as time went on, they became more of a prison, where you got little or no sleep, very little food, and worked very long hours, full of abuse, and they would kick you out at a moment's notice. Even those who just needed shelter for the night were subject to the awful conditions within. As in Margaret's story, in the workhouses, four out of her five siblings died in these workhouses. It is not known how, but the conditions they must have lived in surely answers this question. They do also speculate that Margaret looked after these children, and this may be how she comes about the skills of midwifery. It is believed that her mother was unmarried when she was born and her father's identity is not really known. It is said that after Margaret was born, Elizabeth went on to marry a Robert Nunn and that's how they had five more children, four of which have died in the workhouses apparently in this particular story. It is not mentioned what happens to the fifth sibling that survived. Now we do hear that her mother Elizabeth dies in 1785. When her mother died she would have been around the age of 22. It was most likely at this time that she went to work in domestic services with the local families in the area. This dark version of Margaret's upbringing now aligns with the nicer version where she gains employment with the Cobbold family. But let's go back to the beginning of the nicer version and see what historian Pip Wright of the Suffolk area believes may have been her actual upbringing, which may have largely come from Richard Cobbold's book. It tells the story where Margaret is born to Elizabeth and Jonathan Catchpole. It seems a nicer story compared to that of being brought up in an Acton workhouse. Pip goes on to tell the story where Margaret is brought up on a farm belonging to a Mr and Mrs Denton. Margaret had an older sister by the name of Susan who wasn't a very well child. And as Elizabeth also worked, the taking care of Susan fell very much on Margaret's shoulders, along with whatever Mrs Denton could do to help them. We learn that at an age of around 13, Margaret drops in on Mrs. Denton at the residence and finds that Mrs. Denton has collapsed 
and the servants are all freaking out. They don't know what to do. Margaret comes in and calmly tells the servants what to do and calms Mrs. Denton down. This is possibly due to looking after Susan so long. She knew how to bring down a fever and act calm in a chaotic situation. She knew of a Dr. Stebbing who was located in Ipswich. She ran out to the Suffolk Punches where horses were stabled. Without bridle or saddle, she rode all the way to Ipswich bareback to the house of Dr. Stebbing. The horse now was quite exhausted, so the doctor returned to Nacton in his jig with Margaret alongside him. When he arrived, he found that Mrs. Denton was no longer in too much distress, largely due to the actions of Margaret. At this point, they knew she was very level-headed and resourceful. She met William Lord at a christening while still living with her parents at Mrs. Denton's farm. William Lord's father ran a ferry boat between Harwich and Landguard Point, but her older sister Susan didn't trust him. With her dying breath, she said, Do not marry Will. Please, do not follow him. He'll only lead you astray. This unfortunately did not deter Margaret from William, and although he started an apprentice to a boat builder, living honestly, soon a Captain Bargood persuaded him to lead a team of smugglers running contraband to Suffolk Coast. He started sending Margaret some rich presents, but his reputation got Margaret and her family into trouble with the locals. They knew what Will was doing. This caused the family to be shunned and they fell on hard times. Pip goes on to tell how William Lord and his smugglers get in trouble with the Coast Guard and William ends up injured. News of this gets to Margaret and she quickly rushes to help him. She is taken by a sailor to see William at a place called Walton Cliff. She found him sick and in a lot of pain but after her experience with her sister she was able to nurse him back to health. She goes on to look for work as a maid of all work to Mrs Wake at Priory Farm in Downham Reach. This was now 1792. She was getting quite a name for herself as being very highly regarded and also attracting the attention of another man, John Barry, who had been a brother to one of those who almost killed William. Barry tells Margaret of his love, but she rejects him as she still knows that Will is very much alive, although Barry had believed Will to be dead. William was secretly hiding out in a small cottage close to Butley Abbey, captaining his boat the Stow and assuming a name Hudson. The story goes that William sends a sailor to Priory Farm to tell Margaret that he wanted to meet her at nine o'clock on the shore of Butley Abbey Somehow we end up with a scenario where John Barry is on the foreshore. There is smuggling going on when Will said he was finished with smuggling. And Margaret arrives to find a big mess. In this kerfuffle, other smugglers came to help William and in the end John Barry was shot. Margaret raced to find some help for him and William and the other smugglers escaped upriver. Luckily, John Barry made a full recovery and finding out about a new settlement in New South Wales, Australia, decides to get on a boat and head that way. He begged Margaret to come with him, but she wouldn't. And in the end, he leaves without her. Margaret's heart was still for William Lord. In 1794, Margaret has now gone to Ipswich, where she finds Dr. Stebbing. And she was aged 32 at this time. He assists her in finding work and this is how she ends up being with the Cubbold family. Margaret was accepted into the service and found it a very demanding position, being a nursemaid in the morning and a cook in the evening. John and Eliza Cobbold, a wealthy head of an Ipswich brewing company, his wife Elizabeth or Eliza was a poet 
and she was actually the model for Charles Dickens' character in the Pickwick Papers, Mrs. Leo Hunter. Now we do know that in the cobbled house, they were quite rich and they looked after Margaret as one of their own family. They were based at The Cliff in Ipswich and then later the Manor House at St Margaret's Green. They do go into a bit of a backstory with Elizabeth and John Cobbold. Uh, John was a widow and Elizabeth married him and started taking care of his 15 children from his first wife. So you can see why Margaret was needed in this family. Yeah, 15 children. So Elizabeth marries John knowing full well he's got 15 children. So they get hold of Margaret probably as quick as they could. They married in 1791 and it was 1795 when they got Margaret in. So for four years, Elizabeth was pulling her hair out, looking after 15 of his children, which I'd say if there's 15 of them, they range in different ages. And uh, most likely the older kids were just about ready to fly the coop. They do go on to have seven of their own children. So you can also see why they kept Margaret around for quite a while. It looks as though she may also have started possibly helping Elizabeth deliver these babies. Around this time, 1795, one of the young children, William Cobbold, was a very good shot with his gun and he'd often go out and shoot ducks and bring them back. The day had gone on and he hadn't come back. It was nearing evening. A search party was sent out to try and find young William. The ice over the river was starting to form. It was late in winter. There were many trying to find him in the gloomy water and a boat seemed to come toward the shore. Margaret noticed as soon as she'd seen it that it was Will and together they quickly went out onto the ice to find the boy. It wasn't long before William's keen eye found the little boy William and they quickly got him back into the house. Luckily, putting some warm blankets around him, he came back to good health. This also helped Will's reputation. No longer known only as a smuggler, now he'd rescued the cobbled boy. He was a hero. It wasn't long before another one of the cobbled boys was in distress. Elizabeth finds that one of the children has fallen into their pond. She jumps in even though she couldn't swim herself and saves the youngster. The family grow even more close to her. Now Elizabeth and John have a son in 1797 by the name of Richard and he plays a big role in Margaret Catchpole's story but we'll get to Richard a little bit later. There was news about a British victory over the French in the Napoleonic Wars. A number of the Ipswich men had taken part in, including Will. Margaret grew impatient of his return. And unfortunately, many of the people that knew Will would come to the Cobbold residence and lie about seeing Will so as that they could get a quick feed from the kitchen. Margaret got very upset with them doing this and even turned away one of William's friends, John Luff, who had also said he'd seen him. Turning Luff away had prompted an evil, nasty plan against Margaret and William. So he sends one of his friends, a John Cook, and executed the plan. John Cook tells Margaret that she needed to go to London right away, stealing two horses from the Cobalt stables. And he would show her where Will was, but she had to do it right away. This, of course, was not true, as Luff had actually injured Will Lord, and he was staying with his uncle in Alderborough, around the corner from where Margaret was. Sadly, Margaret believed Cook's story, and not wanting to steal a horse, tells him she can't get there. John Cook threatens to let William know that she no longer cares for him. Cruelly, he blackmails Margaret into going and stealing a horse and riding to London nine hours straight in the hopes to reunite with William again. 
and not knowing that he was in the same district all along. Now these stories are painting quite a picture as before we had no idea why she would have gone to London riding bareback on a horse, stolen from the cobalts. But at least we have some background with this scenario as to why she would have risked it all. Knowing full well horse stealing was punishable by hanging. Still Margaret pressed on, riding all night 70 miles to London. The horse was noticed, being recognised as the Cobalt's horse. Many pursued her right away, knowing that it was stolen, even though Margaret had dressed as a man, pretending to be passed off as possibly John Cobalt. It did not work. Even handbills were printed in the time to make nine o'clock coaches to London, offering 20 guineas for the capture and reward, nearly $3,000 today. On arrival at the Bull in Oldgate, Margaret paid an ostler to rub the horse down, inquiring where she may find a buyer. She'd come this far now. She'd have to sell the horse or risk going back and being captured. Unfortunately for Margaret, they noticed her right away. Constables had already been alerted and she was grabbed, immediately being taken into custody and committed to Newgate Jail. Sadly, Mr and Mrs Cobble journeyed down to the police station. Full of shame and regret, Margaret makes a full confession of guilt, stating that she'd been compelled to act by John Cook under his direction and threats that made mention of William Lord. Efforts were made to find Cook, who had tricked Margaret, but he had now disappeared. Luckily, Margaret was taken from Newgate Prison, as we know that's like living in hell. She was transferred to Ipswich Jail, awaiting trial. She wrote to Elizabeth Cobbold, pleading for forgiveness. Elizabeth Cobbold visited her many times, possibly fearing she'd be hung, and still having warm affection for her. Pip goes on to advise that on the 9th of August, 1797, Margaret pleaded guilty. Several spoke on her behalf, including the Cobolds, but it did not sway the judge. Luckily, the judge handed down the sentence of transportation to New South Wales. Although at the time, due to the war in France, she had to wait in Ipswich jail for ships to come back. In some bizarre twist, William ends up at Ipswich Jail as well, although it's not specified why he was caught. Possibly he was smuggling again. Either way, Margaret finds out that they are both in the same jail, and a plan for both of them to escape and run away is soon hatched. On the 25th of March, it was washing day at the jail. She used this to her advantage bundling up clothes and disguising herself. At 11pm, after the jailer had come round, she quickly ducked out and made a ladder of clothes in which she used to throw over the side of the wall, climbing it, getting between the spikes at the top and using clothes horses to make it over the 22-foot high wall. She finally made it over. The bells of St Clement sounded at 12 o'clock. Climbing the low wooden palings against the road, she made her way to St Helen's Church and to William. By this time, Margaret had now been found missing and everybody was on the lookout for them. They were able to dress as sailors. It didn't take long for the constables to catch up to them. They'd made it to the river, but were caught on the bay. Margaret quickly ran into the sea but was caught on a wave and it threw her back ashore. Lord stood over her body with a pistol in each hand. There was an exchange of gunfire and William Lord was shot dead on the bay. Margaret knows now that Will is dead. There is no longer going to be a happy ending for the both of them. She is taken back to Ipswich Jail and tried, expecting to be hung. However, the judge once again gives her transportation to Australia, this time, though, for life. Elizabeth comes to visit her one last time, 
knowing that they'll never see each other again. The ladies promise to write to each other once she arrives in Australia. We will continue with Margaret's story as she goes to Australia a little later. Let's move on to Mary Reby. Unlike Margaret, Mary's story in England doesn't have a lot of information. We do know she was a horse dealer and that another similarity was that she dressed as a man when she stole the horse. It's very strange that both women who stole horses both dressed as men to go unnoticed. At first it seemed that Mary only took a horse for a joy ride, but the more that you look into it, it seems to be more of a ploy to run away. Mary was born on the 12th of May, 1777. She was born as Mary Haddock in Bury, Lancashire, in England. It must have been a sad childhood for Mary, as we know that she lost her parents fairly early and was being raised by her grandmother. It is very speculated that stealing the horse was a ploy to run away. She was dressed as a boy and going under the name James Burrow. It seems she planned the whole escapade. It wasn't just a spur of the moment, oh, there's a horse, I'm going to grab that and take off. It looks as though she had pre-organised what she was going to do. She'd already picked out the horse and found some boy's clothing, possibly a neighbour or perhaps a cousin or someone in in the neighbourhood she could readily get the outfit from. And she already picked out the name James Burroughs. Where she was going to go with the horse is not known, but she must have just been going to run away. Heaven knows what kind of a childhood she had. It is not written anywhere that I could find. What led up to this moment, what made a young girl of around 13 steal a horse dressed as a boy and already going by the name James Burroughs. It is known that when she was arrested, they did believe she was a boy. She must have cut her hair really short or at least tied it back to go looking like a boy to not be noticed as a female. It wasn't until her trial that they realised or were told that she was actually female and that her name was Mary Haydock. It is very strange that we don't have a lot of information about Mary. Perhaps it was that she was very embarrassed of the reasons behind running away and dressing like a boy and then being arrested and transported to Australia for horse stealing. We do know when she gets to Australia that she becomes very wealthy. But we'll get to that part a bit later. So perhaps the truth died with Mary She didn't want it to get out. There were too many influential people around. Too many people who, if they found out her dark secrets, perhaps her reputation would be tarnished. Mary Haydock was transported to Australia aboard the Royal Admiral convict ship for a sentence of seven years. It must have been scary to know that you were going to be sent away But then, she did run away from her grandmother. She did intend not to go back. Perhaps Mary is on board the Royal Admiral and is excited about the trip ahead. She's not going to be hung. She's not going to Newgate Prison, where I'm sure she's heard of the horrors that the women there have had to experience. She's going to a new country a new place, undiscovered. Perhaps she is sitting aboard the ship, contemplating her new endeavours. It is not known what was going through her mind, but what is coming up for Mary, I'm sure even she could not fathom. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how she got to Australia. Just that she came here and made a really good life for herself. But we'll get to that in part two. It's so fascinating. The lives of these two women and their adventures 
could not be contained to just one episode. And we couldn't split them because they are so similar. And their stories on more than one occasion have been mixed because their adventures were so aligned. So we had to split their stories into two parts. Despite these women being classed as convicts or horse stealers, they're very admirable. Both very driven women. They went from basically nothing and making a really good life for themselves, which we'll go into more in part two. We hope you have enjoyed this episode on Margaret Catchpole and Mary Reby. Stay tuned for part two, the fascinating stories where they both come to Australia and still lead similar lives, but in different worlds and experience different things. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share and hit that notification bell so you're aware when we post our new episodes.